where we left off last time. So we were talking about vector spaces. What are vector spaces? I have the sheet with you. In case you don't remember, you refer to the sheet. Okay. It's simply a set that is closed under uh, two operations, right? Scalar multiplication and vector addition. Any set that is closed under these two operations, uh, assuming we know how these are defined, then it's a vector space. And typically, any Rn is a vector space. So now let's look at some examples and see if, um, whether or not these are vector spaces. Um, now, let's say I define a set like this. First example we look at is V1. Uh, a set of numbers x such that x is a real number and the model. You read this as such that uh, sometimes you might see people use colon or a vertical line like this. So this, you read this as, uh, this is a set of x such that x is a real number and the magnitude of x is less than or equal to 1. On the real line, what would this look like? Let's say this is 0. Where would the set lie? Or the set of all these points, where would they lie on this real line? Where? On the right side, isn't it? But, okay, a set of real numbers, that means they, those are points that lie on this line, and the magnitude is less than 1. Okay, only positive numbers, is it? All positive numbers? If you, if you take minus 2, right? Modulus of minus 2 is 2. 2 is not less than 1. So, 2 minus 2 is not there. What about plus 2? Is plus 2 there in this set? No, so, okay, 0 is there, yes, you are right, okay, is that it, so this is 1, what about 0 to minus 1, is that included as well, it is, right, yeah, because the magnitude is less than 1, if I put minus 1 here, minus 1 is equal to, uh, my magnitude of minus 1 is equal to 1, so this is okay, so this is essentially my set. And now we are asking, does this set, so this is this one, does this set form a vector space? All you, okay, uh, when you are confronted with a question like that, all you do is look at the definition and see if these two properties are satisfied. You take uh, an example from here or uh, element from the set, you do these two operations and see if it satisfies. It is not enough if you just take one element and you find that it satisfies uh, scalar multiplication vector uh, addition. For a set to be uh, a vector space, this has to be satisfied by every possible element in the set and every possible real number that you use for scaling. Okay. See, one quick test is the vector space is supposed to have 0. This has 0. So, it can be a vector space. If 0 was not there, then of course, you immediately say it is not a vector space. <laughs> so, this could be a vector space because 0 is there. Uh, if I take 0, and I multiply it by any real number alpha, I get 0. So, it looks like if, at least for the 0 element, this is closed. Right? Uh, if I do any scalar multiplication, uh, I get 0 back. And if I add the two zeros, I still get 0. So, at least with respect to this element, it seems it seems to be closed. Okay. What about any other element? Well, let's say we take 0.5. If I multiply it by, let's say, 2, I get 1. 1 is still in this set, so that's fine. But what if I multiply it by 3? I get 1.5. 1.5 is not in this set. That means this is not closed under scalar multiplication. Once you find, find, a, find an example that does not satisfy one of these, then you're done. Then you know it's not a vector space. Okay? So this is not a vector space. Okay? Because you can find an element that is not closed under scalar multiplication. And similarly, if you take, uh, well, if you take, if you do vector addition, uh, you will still have examples where it is not close. If I take 0. 0.7 and 0. 0.5 and add them, I get 1.2. 1.2 is outside the set. So, this is not a vector space. So, that is one example. What about a set like this? I will simply write down the definition of the set and you can tell me where the set lies in the real line. 
I won't write x is a real number. We'll assume x is always a real number. Where does this line? It's all this. Is this a vector space? I mean, don't think. Just do the same thing I did before. Zero is there. Okay, so you're so it can be. You take an element, you check for both of these, and then see if it's satisfied. If you can find a counter example which uh, which shows you that you, if you do scalar multiplication or addition, you go outside the set, then you're done. Then you say it's not a vector space. Why? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good. So if you take one and you multiply it by minus one, you go outside. So this is not a vector. So this is not a vector space. This is also not. Then it takes up a field also. Yes. Okay. Here, uh, the scalar, uh, a field uh, has to include negative numbers uh, because you have to have the inverse of uh, any element in the field. Okay. Now, don't worry about what a field is. Uh, real numbers form, form a field uh, and that includes everything. Right. So, that, that, that restriction is there. Your scalars can be anything. Even though your set is defined like this, you should have the freedom to choose the scalars however you want. Any element from a, from the field that you're working in. Okay. Let's. So we've only looked at R one now. Let's look at something a little bit more interesting. We we'll look at something from R two, where uh, x one is less than or equal to one, x two is less than or equal to one. What does this set look like now? Here in R2. The set of all points that uh, of the set. What will it look like? It's a diamond, isn't it? Okay, like this. Okay. So let's check if that is correct. Let's say I choose the point one one. Is one one in the set? 1, 1. It is, but the way I have drawn it, it's outside, so it's, it's not the diamond. Square, exactly. So, if this is minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1, this is it. Same thing. Is it a vector space? No, it's not. See, uh, one thing is to do it uh, algebraically. Other thing is, if you take any point here, a vector, you can scale the vector how much ever you want. You can scale it such that it leaves the boundary. That means it, it, you can go outside if you do scalar multiplication. So this is not a vector. Again, space. Um, with this. X. X1 is any real number. The first number of this set is X1, and the second number is 2 times X1. What would this look like? This is X1, this is X2. Sorry? Hey, hold on. How is this a rectangle? X1 X1 is R. That means X1 can be anything. It can be any, any number between plus or minus infinity. No, what will the uh, set of points look like? I'm pretty sure you know. What is it? Well, if you're not clear, just take some examples for x1. x1 can be any real number. If you put 0 here, you get 0. So, 0 is included. So, it can be a vector space. If you put 1 here, this will be 1, 2. So, that's 1, 2. If I put minus 1 here, minus 1, minus 2. And if... And if you work this out, it will essentially be, uh, this, this set is essentially this line that passes through the origin. Is this a vector space now? Okay, why is it a vector space? No, hold on. That is only for, that's only scaling, right? Uh, you have to very, it has to satisfy both these properties, right? Now, if you take an element here, to see whether or not it's closed under scalar multiplication, you stretch the vector 
if you stretch the vector, it will always stay in this line. So, it looks like scalar multiplication is okay. Uh, and you can also flip, so no problem. It will still stay in this line. What about vector addition? If I take two vectors from this, say v1 and another vector v2, if I add them, where will the result, the resultant of this, uh, of the sum of these two lie? Will it go? How will you do vector addition here? What is the process that we discussed yesterday? Yes. Well, you can't draw a parallelogram here because both of them are collinear. So, there is no parallelogram. What do you do? You take this, you move the base of this vector to the tip of this, and then you, and the resultant vector is from the, the original base to the tip of the second vector. So, if you do vector addition, you'll, you'll find out that this, in fact, stays in the line. So, this is actually an example of a vector space. This is, yes, this is a vector space. Okay. In fact, instead of this 2, if I had made this an arbitrary number, any m, m can be uh, a number, any real number, then it's essentially all possible lines that pass through the origin. So, uh, in R2, all straight lines that pass through the origin actually form a vector space. Okay, R2 itself is a vector space and uh, straight lines that pass through the origin form a vector space. And you can, I would encourage you, so I made geometric argument, I would encourage you to also verify this uh, uh, algebraically. We will just look at one final example and then we will move on. Again in R2. What will this look like now? X1 and X1 square. X1 can be any, any real number. Yeah, it will be a parabola. Okay, what about this? It won't, okay? Uh, you can show it uh, algebraically, but let us look at it geometrically, right? If you choose a point here, then the vector corresponding to that point is this vector, right? If you scale this vector, it of course will go outside this line, right? So it's not a vector space. So it does it is not closed under scalar multiplication. This this is also not a vector space. Okay. See, out of all the examples we've seen, uh, it looks like uh, at least uh, sets that we choose in R, R or R n sets that are finite in size in some sense don't form vector spaces. Okay. And sets that have a curved shape don't seem to be vector spaces, but uh, something like this, which has a flat uh, shape, uh, appear to be vector space, at least from these examples. And in fact, that that is true. Uh, vector spaces is essentially the study of flat spaces in higher dimensions. Okay, but flat spaces that pass through the origin that is the restriction that we have. Right. For example, if you had an if you had a set uh, like this, right. You can think about what the corresponding definition of the set will be for a line like this. This is not a vector space, even though this is a flat space. This is not a vector space because it does not pass through the origin. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now the next thing that we look at is essentially uh, uh, in, uh, based on this, uh, which is called a sub subspace. Subspace of a vector space. If we know what a set is, then what is a subset? Yeah, okay. Let's say we have a parent set A, and I say B is a subset of A, and this symbol stands for subset. When do you say that B is a subset of A? Sure. Okay. If all elements of B are present in A, then you say B is a subset of A. Okay. Subspace is essentially that. We know, I mean, vector space is a set with some special properties. Uh, if it's a set, then I can form a subset of that set, right? Uh, a subspace is essentially a subset of a vector space, which is also a vector space. Okay. Now, if I have a vector space P, I ha take a subset 
W. That means all elements of W are present in V. And if V, because V is also set, I can ask, is this a vector space? If this is also a vector space, then this is also this is the subspace of V. See? Now, we've already seen examples of subspace of V. So, if V is R2 for us, okay, this W is a subset of R2 and it's a vector space. That means this is a subspace of R2. Okay. Um, if you now talk about R3, right, uh, three-dimensional space, any line that passes through the origin in R3 is a vector, is a subspace of R3. Any plane that passes through the origin is also a subspace of R3. Okay. And then, of course, whole of R3 is uh, trivially the subspace of R3 as well. And interestingly, if you choose the zero element, that is always a subspace of your uh, uh, of R3 or Rn, right? because this is a subset of uh, Rn, and this is closed under uh, scalar multiplication and vector addition. Okay. Okay. Similarly, in higher dimension, uh, you would, uh, uh, for example, in Rn. Uh, any uh, hyperplane that passes through the origin, hyperplane is just a plane in higher dimensions, <laughs> plane or line in higher dimensions, will be a subspace of Rn. Okay. Okay. Let's say we have a parent space V and it has two subspaces. We, we found two subspaces, S1 and S2. Uh, there is an addition operation that we can define on subspaces. Remember earlier we talked about addition of two vectors. Here I'm talking about addition of two sets, S1 and S2 are sets, which are subsets of V, and they are vector spaces themselves. The definition is very simple. And I might be wrong. I think the special symbol they use for the addition of subspaces is plus with the circle. This means I'm adding, essentially, I'm adding two subspaces. And the definition of this is very simple. This is a set of all, sum of all vectors v1 and v2, this step, v1 comes from s1, you are essentially taking, forming a new set which contains the sum of all possible combinations of elements that come from s1 and s2, okay. So, for example, this is S1, let's see, this is S2. Now, if you want to know where is S1 plus X, S2, you simply take an element from uh, S1, an element from S2. These are two vectors. You add them and you'll get a new vector that will be in S1 plus in S2. You take another combination, you add them, you get another power. So, essentially, if you take the sum of all possible combinations of elements from S1 and S2, that will essentially be this set. In the case of R2, if you have two subspaces like this and you take the sum of them, what you will get, so in this case, S1 plus S2 will in fact give you R2. You can generate any vector from R2 by simply adding elements from these two subspaces. But in higher dimensions, uh, you might, uh, it depends, uh, uh, addition of two subspaces might not produce the entire space. For example, if you talk about R3, let's say I have two lines that pass through the origin, two subspaces. If you add them, if you add the two subspaces, you won't get R3. You will only get a, get the plane that contains both those lines. Okay. But if you had three uh, lines that pass through the origin uh, in R3, and if you add the three of them together, then you get R3. Okay. <laughs> this we'll find is, is, a, is a useful thing to uh, know later on. Okay. <laughs> Again, as I said before, these are all things that you just remember. Okay? Uh, uh, and hopefully, as we go deeper into the course, some of these will start to then uh, make sense. Okay, before I, uh, I continue, right? If I take two subspaces S1 and S2, and if I add them together, I get another set, right? I'll call that S3. Okay. okay. Is this new set a, ve a vector space? You don't have to answer it now, but this is something you can maybe write it down. See if you can 
show whether or not this is uh, another vector space S3, the sum of two subspaces, does it form a vector space? So with that, we'll move on to uh, uh, another important topic. And before that, we'll introduce another operation uh, that we can perform on vectors. It's called a linear combination of vectors. This is uh, very simple. It's nothing but a combination of scaling and vector uh, vector addition. Let's say we have two vectors v1 and v2 from Rn. Okay. When if you say you're taking a linear combination of these two vectors, all you're doing is you're doing this operation. If you're taking some scalar, a real number alpha one, multiplying it by v1, and you're taking alpha two, another real number, multiplying it by v2, and then you're adding them to it. This operation is called a linear combination, right? And here, alpha 1 and alpha 2 are, can be any real number. Okay. And this will, in fact, produce another vector, v3, which will also belong to. Okay. There are, in fact, if you go look at the notes, there are other combinations as well. There's something called a fine combination. There is convex combination and there is conic. All these differ, uh, or I mean, these differ from a linear combination just based on what restrictions you place on alpha 1 and alpha 2. And all of these have nice geometric uh, meaning as well. So these, and these are very useful. But we won't talk about these much. But this is just for you to know that there are other ways of combining vectors uh, as well, which, which are quite useful. Now, if you look at this, right, uh, one way to think about this operation is, you see this vector v1 contains some meaningful information for you, and this vector v2 contains another set of information, right? When you say you're do taking the linear combination, all you're doing is you're taking uh, the information from v1, you're giving that information some weightage, alpha 1, you're giving this information some weightage, alpha 2, and you are by adding them together in some you are in some way mixing that information together. So you can think of this operation as some sort of mixture, okay? And uh, the weightage that you give uh, to generate this mixtures are your alpha one and alpha two. So you can think of alpha one and alpha two as weights that you give for the individual vectors. And the addition operation is is an operation of just mixing stuff together. Okay, this is uh, I think an, a nice way of interpreting uh, what the linear combination is. So, okay. With that defined, we'll now, uh, now, say we have Rn. Say we choose a set of vectors from Rn. Okay. Uh, I'll call that set, uh, let's say W. Vn. Okay. Each of these vectors is an element from Rn. Okay. Let's assume for now I, I choose a finite number of vectors. Um, useful concept uh, uh, that's associated with this set is okay. You could ask, okay, I have this set. I learned about this interesting way of mixing vectors together called linear combination. You could ask, can I take these vectors? And find out all their possible linear combinations and generate another set. Okay, just for fun. Okay, so you take, so here, before I continue, I've here only talked about linear combination of two vectors, but if you have m vectors here, then you can take the linear combination of this as well, except now you'll, you'll need m real numbers. So that'll, so that'll be alpha 1, v1, for 2, v2, alpha m, vm, where each alpha i is the real number. This is a linear combination of these m, m vectors. Okay, so you could ask, okay, if I take these vectors and I take all possible linear combinations of these vectors, then I will, I'll get a set. Okay, and it turns out this is a useful set. Okay, and this has a special name to it. This is called the span of this original set W. So later on, when you hear me talk about the span of a set, 
all i'm talking about is is another set which is generated by taking all the possible linear combinations of elements from w okay that when you hear about it first maybe it's a little too abstract we'll again associate geometry with this to make this a little bit easier to digest so let's let's talk about r it's easy is very very comfortable with that okay. let's say i choose uh, a set uh, w that's got 12 minus 1 minus 2 this is my v1 this is my v2 okay because i'm i'm only i'm working with r these are one vectors so essentially scalars okay that corresponds to this vector here this is v1 this is v2 v1 and minus 2 is here Now, if I take the span of this uh, set, right, what all can I generate? What all will be there in the span of W? Well, it's just a linear combination of these two numbers. That means the elements here will be of this form alpha 1 times 1 plus alpha 2 times minus 2, and where alpha 1, alpha 2, can be any real number. Okay, so this is essentially set of all points that are generated like this. Okay, and what will those those be? Will it be all of R? It is right. It will be all of R, right? Because I can generate any real number as a linear combination of these two. Right. So uh, in this particular case, if you take if you have a set like this and you ask what is the span of the set. In this particular case, it's all of R. Okay, let's look at an example in R two. Let's say I, I start with an initial example W one, which is just V one, and then I ask what is if I only have V one, and I ask what is the span of uh, V one. Or span of W. Yeah, the linear. Okay, if you have only one vector, right? The linear combination is simply this alpha times V one, all with all possible values for alpha. So what? Where will this set lie? If I were to draw a picture for this for span of W one, what will it look like? Yeah, exactly. Uh, will it be the entire plane? Because see, the elements here, right, will look like this: alpha one times V one. That's it. Where alpha one can be any real number, right? You, that means it's essentially scaled versions of v one. That means it'll only be this. Okay, it'll so it'll only be this uh, set of these points. If I had only one one v one, okay. But if I chose another set w two. Let's say V2 was this. Now, if I ask what is the span of W2, what would you say? So, this will be all elements like this alpha 1, V1, alpha 2, V2. Well, Think about it geometrically, right? I take V1, I can scale it however I want. I can take V2, I can scale it however I want, and I simply add them together. If I add these two together, I get this point. If I stretch this here, I get this point. If I stretch this here, I get this point. And if I flip their directions, so it looks like I can generate all of R2. Okay. So in this case, when I had two vectors, when I had W2, the span of W2 is all of R2. So here, uh, the span of V1 and V2 is all of R. Okay. So what is essentially happening is if you have a set of vectors w and you do a and you do a span operation and find a new set what you will find is a subspace of your original space rn that contains all of these vectors okay. that's all <clears throat> uh, similarly you can think if you had uh, 
vectors in R3, and if you take the linear combination, you'll get you'll generate some uh, a subspace uh, in R3 and in, in general Rn. Okay. So uh, the span of W uh, will be uh, uh, subspace of Rn because your original V1, V2, Vm came from Rn. That's your parent space. Or another way to think about this, right? So you ha you you started with a set like this, okay, uh, and then you did a linear combination operation to generate an even bigger set. See, this is a finite. This contains a finite number of elements. This has an infinite number of elements. Okay, so you essentially managed to generate an infinite number of stuff from from a finite number of elements. Okay, and uh, each element here uh, essentially tells you what all points in Rn you can reach just using this set and the linear combination operation. So essentially what points can I, uh, if you just give me these two vectors, where all can I reach? If I'm only allowed to do linear combination. Okay. So that's essentially your uh, your span. Okay. And it's a subspace of Rn. Okay. Now with that idea, we move to a very important concept called linear independence. Yes, this is absolutely crucial. Uh, everything, a, a lot of stuff that we will look later on, uh, talk about later on, relies on this. Okay. And the idea is very simple. Okay. Okay. Span, if you say span of a set, it produces another set. Linear independence, on the other hand, is a property of a set. Let's say I have that same set W. Okay. I can ask, whether or not this set has this property of linear independence. Okay. Uh, and that I'll first state what that is, uh, how you test for linear independence algebraically, and then we'll think about, and then we'll discuss about what it really means geometrically. Okay. I have a set W uh, of V1 and V2. We say that this set is linearly independent. Whenever I write something like this, it means if and only if. Okay. If I take the elements of W and I take a linear combination, I take alpha 1, V1, alpha 2, V2, alpha M, Vn. Okay. And I equate this to 0. Okay. I'm free to choose my alphas. Okay. I want to know what values I would need to choose for my alphas, alpha 1 to alpha m, to produce a zero vector. Okay. If the, for the given set of m vectors, if the only choice for alpha 1 to alpha m that will give me zero vector is all the alpha should be zero, then you say the set is linearly independent. Okay. If this is true, see, uh, uh, we notice this. If I have any set of vectors and I choose alphas to be 0, it will obviously produce 0. But if that is the only choice that will give me 0, then it is linearly independent. If there are other, cho if of course, 0 will always, 0 alphas will always produce 0. But if there are other non zero values for alphas that gives me 0, then it is not linearly independent. You say it is linearly dependent. So that is the condition. Okay, so what does this mean geometrically? Okay. See, when you say a set is is linearly independent, what that essentially means is uh, there is no redundancy in the set. Okay, we'll we'll see why that is. Uh, so there is no redundancy right that means every element of the uh, of that set w contains information that is not contained in something else okay so you need uh, uh, you kind of have to keep all the elements uh, because all of them carry slightly different information okay and i'm using the word information very loosely here just for just to get a feel for what this idea is 
Okay. If it is linearly dependent, then there is redundancy. Redundancy. That means there are elements in that set whose information can be extracted from others. You don't really need that particular element. Okay. To see why that is right. And what we mean by we can extract that information from other elements in a set if it if a set is linearly dependent. Now imagine that uh, some of the alpha i's are not zero. Okay, they they're not all zero, right? Uh, let's assume alpha m is definitely not zero. This we know, right? That means if alpha m is not zero, uh, then what I do is I I take the rest of them and I move it to the other side. Then I get alpha m, v m. Simply minus alpha 1 v1 minus alpha 2 v2, so on and so forth. Alpha m minus minus 1 v m minus 1. Alpha m is not 0, that means I can write v m like this. So I move the alpha m to, to the uh, right hand side and I divide it like this. Okay. Since alpha m is not 0, I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed, allowed to divide real numbers with the denominator not zero. There. This is what we this is what I meant by there is redundancy in the set. If the set is linearly dependent, then I could have derived Vm using the vectors V1 to Vm minus 1 by simply taking a linear combination. I mean I might not know what the linear combination is, but I can still produce it. Okay. Or another way to say this, uh, this is one way to say it. Or another way to think about this is like this. Now, if you say Vm is a linear combination of the first m minus 1 elements of your set W, that means Vm is in the span of the set of vectors uh, from V1 to Vm minus 1. Okay, Because span is essentially all the elements that are linear combinations. That means Vm has to be in the span of something else. So, when you say uh, linearly independent, that means no element is in the span of uh, all the other elements in, in that set. Okay, if it's linearly dependent, then at least one element is there in the other one. Okay. And uh, another consequence of this definition is if W has a zero element, okay, let's say I have something like this E1, E2, and then I have the zero element and then Vm. If you have a zero element in your set W, this set is always linearly dependent, okay, according to this definition, because I could have chosen all the alphas to be zero, except for the alpha corresponding to the zero vector. I can choose it to be any number I want, non-zero number, and still produce a zero vector, right? That means this is not satisfied. So if you have a situation where you have a set of vectors that has a zero element, then you know it's not a linearly independent set. It's a li it's linearly dependent. Okay. We will look at a couple of examples, uh, and hopefully become clear. Let's choose R first, right? Is this a linearly independent dependent set? It only has one vector. Independent, yes, because alpha times 1 will produce 0 only if you choose alpha to be 0. There is no other real number you can choose that will give me 0. Okay. What if I choose this? Yeah. Is this linearly independent or dependent? Why? Well, you choose alpha 1 times 1 plus alpha 2 times 2 and you need to produce a 0 vector. You can choose non-zero alphas that will produce this. So, this is linearly dependent. Okay. Let's look at an example in R2. <clears throat> is this linearly dependent or independent? Well, you so this needs to produce this. That means alpha alpha has to be 0, 0. The only way you will get the 0 vector is both alphas are 0. That means the only linear combination that will produce a 0 vector if I choose alpha to be 0, that means this is linearly independent. What about what if I add one more element to this?
if I take this one one and I add one zero. You will have to show me why it's dependent. You'll have to explain. Sorry. Hey, hold on. Okay, okay. Here. When I say zero, right? It's the zero element of the vector space. We are talking about elements from R2. The zero element of the vector space is vector where both of them are zeros. That's a zero element. Sorry. So that's why I put the under under bar. That's a zero element of the vector space, not just the scalar zero. Write down the linear combination, right? So it's alpha 1 times 1, 1 plus alpha 2 times 1, 0. And this needs to produce 0, 0. If you uh, compute the elements of this vector, you'll have alpha 1 plus alpha 2 and alpha 1. Now, can you say if it's linearly dependent or independent? Oh, dependent, is it white? That okay, when you say dependent, that means there is a non zero alpha 1, alpha 2 that will result in this uh, equation being satisfied. Okay, let's look at element wise, right? Maybe uh, uh, looking at them simultaneously is difficult. If you look at it element wise, let's look at this one because this is only one element. What is the value of alpha 1 for this to, for alpha 1 to be 0? Alpha 1 is 0. If alpha 1 is 0, okay, alpha, alpha 1 has to be 0. That means alpha 1 plus alpha 2 is just alpha 2. If that has to be equal to 0, alpha 2 has to be 0. Right? So the only possibilities for alpha 1 and alpha 2 that will give you 0, 0 is if both of them are 0. So this is in fact a linearly independent set. What if I did this? Hmm. Now, what do we have? So this will be alpha 1 plus 2 alpha 2, alpha 1 plus 2 alpha 2. It's dependent, right? Uh, I mean, I can choose any value for, I mean, if I choose this to be minus 2 and minus, minus 2 and 1, this will be 0 and this will also be 0. That means a non-zero set of values for alpha 1 and alpha 2 is giving me the 0 vector. So this in fact is independent. dependent. Okay. That's the idea. Okay. Right. So with that, we now come back to the, the idea of uh, the span of a set of vectors. Okay. So we started off with this, with this finite a finite number of elements, a uh, set with finite number of elements. And then with this, we then produced a huge set that was called the span of W, essentially all the possible linear combinations of W. Okay. So we say this set is the span of W uh, that's in this direction, or you call uh, W is the spanning set. Of okay. imagine, I mean, uh, this uh, sounds like it's circular. Imagine we had, we gave another uh, representation for this. Let's say this was called the set Y. Okay, let's say the set Y is the span of W. Okay, then you say W is the spanning set of Y. Okay, essentially that means uh, you uh, W can be generated from. Uh, sorry, y can be generated from w by simply taking linear combinations. Okay, that also means if I choose an element, let's say um, v that belongs to span of w, right? If v belongs to the span of w, that means there is some linear combination of the elements of w that can produce v, right? That means I can write v like this. I'll use a different notation so that I'll say I don't have to uh, rewrite everything. So this essentially means the linear combination. Sum of all elements uh, of vi multiplied by some scalar alpha i, i going from 1 to n. Okay. That means I can write v like this. Okay. Or another way to say this is this vector v, if I met, if I want to convey to you uh, this vector v, and let's say both of us know what W is. Okay, both of us are, have agreed that this W is some special 
uh, set that both of us like very much. And I want to convey some information to you, especially this vector V. All I would have to do is tell you these alpha i's, and then you will know exactly what that V is, right? So V can now be essentially represented by these m numbers. Okay, if I give you these m numbers, you, you can perfectly reconstruct V. I don't have to send, imagine this V is a, a vector that's, that has a million elements. Let's say m is just 10. Okay, then I only have to send you these 10 numbers, and then you can produce this uh, vector that is, that's a million elements uh, long. Okay. So now, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the nice thing about uh, having a spanning set is that you can represent vectors from uh, the set uh, y using just these numbers. Okay. Now you could ask, okay, uh, are these is this representation unique? Right. If I give you a vector v, is there only one possible set of alpha i's that I can use to produce v from w, or are there more? Maybe there are two, maybe there are 10, or maybe there are infinite number of combinations. Okay. And that turns out to be an important question. right? Uh, so if this is the representation of V, we can ask, is this representation unique? Unique. Okay. And whether or not that representation is unique, is essentially determined by this property of W that we started with and whether or not it is linearly independent. Okay, If the set that you started with was linearly independent, then it turns out that this representation is always unique. There is only one way in which I can produce any element in the, uh, in the span of W. There is, there is no other way. Okay. On the other hand, if the original set that you started with was not linearly independent, was linearly dependent, then it turns out every vector v has an infinite number of possible representations that, uh, that it has. Okay? So, if you have a set w that is linearly independent, then elements of span of w have a unique representation. If it's linearly dependent, do not have a unique representation. <laughs> yes, it's a weightage, yes. Yes, you can choose. You are free to choose alphas to be any real number. Okay, let's look at a concrete example. Okay, that's W. Okay, I can choose my alpha one to be five, and then three. If I do this, then I generate what eight. 8 and 5. Okay. If I choose this to be minus 3.1 and this to be 4, 1, 0, then what do I produce? I produce 0. 0.9 and minus 3.1. So I can choose my alpha i's to be anything I want and I'll, I'll keep generating a whole bunch of new vectors. Okay. Now, if this set is linearly independent, Yes, alpha 1 is variable. Alpha 1 is not fixed. What is fixed is the set W that you started with. Okay. Uh, the point I'm making here is if this is my W I started with and I want to uh, generate 8, 5, the only possible values for alpha 1 and alpha 2 that will let me generate 8, 5 through a linear combination of these two are 5 and 3. Okay. Uh, there is nothing else that will produce 8 and 5, 8, 5. If it's linearly independent, okay. If it's not linearly independent, you can verify that this is not linearly independent, okay. This takes. Uh, this will produce eight five. 
Can you think of another combination? Let's say I, I take this as 10. I take this as um, I don't see it, but I'll I'll huh? three five is okay. Oh yes, perfect. Yes. This will produce. In fact, if you can produce two like this, there is a systematic way in which you can produce all possible infinite combinations that will give you eight five. Okay. So uh, whenever uh, then for you to have unique representation, the set that you the spanning set has to be uh, linearly independent. And if the spanning set is linearly independent, then it has a special name. Okay. So if W is linearly independent, then you say W is a basis for span W. Okay. And uh, a set which is a basis for some other set means that you can generate every element in that big set through a unique linear combination of elements of W, elements of that basis. Okay. So, basis in a way, uh, if you say W is basis, is, is a basis of something, it has enough number of elements to uh, reach all the points uh, in, a, in a vector space and it, it can do that in a, in a unique fashion. And there is only one way you, in which you can reach any element in the vector space. Right? For example, if you're talking about R2, right? If you had just these two vectors, 1, 1, and 1, 0. So uh, 1, 0 is here. 1, 1, this is V1. This is V2. What is the span of V1 and V2? Essentially, the linear combination of V1 and V2. It's all of R2. Okay, you can generate any element from uh, R2. Uh, and it also turns out that these two vectors do form a basis for R2. That means I can generate any, I can reach any point in R2 using just these two vectors. And there is a unique way in which I can do that. Okay, there is no redundancy. Okay, right, that's the idea. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, there is no one unique basis. I, I said a basis, not the basis, because you can have infinite number of bases for R2. This is one basis. This is another basis. These two vectors, this set can now generate all of R2. This can generate. Okay. As long as this, this set is linearly independent, you're fine. You, you can, it'll be a basis for R2. But the moment I add a third vector, okay, the span of this is still R2, but this is not linearly independent. There is too much, there is redundancy here. I can reach this point. Uh, through infinite linear combinations of these three. Whereas if I did not have this, there is only one possible linear combination that could have allowed me to reach this point. Okay. Well, if I removed one, right, is this set a basis for R2? Why? Why is it not a basis for R2? Exactly. Uh, it's linearly independent, but it's not a basis for R2 because it cannot generate all the points of R2. But it is a basis for this subspace. It can generate all points in the subspace in, in a unique fashion. But if I had two vectors like this, right, these two will span the subspace, but these two, this set does not form a basis anymore because there is too much. Because every point on this subspace can be now expressed in infinite number of ways as a linear combination of these two. Okay. All right. So that's another very important idea that you have to remember. And because there are these infinite, I mean, there are infinite number of bases for, for any vector space, there are some that are special, okay? And before we look at uh, how and why they are special, we will look at two other uh, concepts. First one is called the standard inner product. So whenever I say something like this, you already know, if I've said standard inner product, there must be non-standard inner products. And if I've said inner product, there's probably an outer product. And it is, you will, we will see all those uh, later on. The definition is very simple. The standard inner product is, uh, let's imagine this as, as a function, mathematical function, that takes two vectors, x and y. Okay. And then it produces a single real number. Okay. And where x and y, 
or uh, vectors from RL. Definition is very simple, and this is exactly your dot product from uh, either vector uh, vector algebra or physics. So if you let's say you have to you have these two vectors, right? This is x1, x2, xn, y1, y2, yn. The standard linear product is represented like this: x raised to some uh, raised to t, y. All you do is you take these two vectors, multiply the individual elements corresponding to the same index, and then you add them all together. So you take x1 multiplied by y1. You take x2 multiplied by y2, you take xn multiplied by yn, and then you simply add all of them together. Okay. More compactly, you can represent it like this. Okay. Remember the dot product, uh, if you are used to writing stuff like this, a z k cap, and if you had bx i cap, by j cap, plus v z k cap. What is the inner product between these two vectors? Well, you simply multiply a x b x, a y b y, a z b z, and you add them together. Okay, that's exactly this, except this is in, in a higher dimension. This was only in three dimensions. Okay. See, that's the standard inner product. Uh, there are other possible inner products as well. Essentially, functions that will take two vectors and spit out a real number. Okay, uh, for any, so you can't have any function that uh, that can be qualified as an inner product. For some function to for for a box like this to be called an inner product, a valid inner product, it has to satisfy some properties. Uh, you can take a look at those properties in uh, in the lecture slides. So the, those are important, but again, uh, uh, I am not going to go through that in the lecture. If there is anything you don't understand, you can just come talk to me later. Okay, so one, uh, so that's the standard inner product. Um, we will look at what this means geometrically, but before that, we need to look at another concept. It's called the norm of a, of a vector. Okay, this is essentially the idea of the size of a vector, not uh, size of the vector as in number of elements, but the magnitude of the vector. How big is a vector? For example, if I gave you two vectors like this. 2000 and 4000 and I asked you which of these two vectors is big or which which one's bigger than the other most of us would say this it looks like this vector is bigger than the other now how do we capture that notion uh, very precisely right we know how to do that in r r2 and r3 right to calculate the length of a vector how do you compute the length of a vector in r3 if these are the coordinates of the vector what would be, how do you compute the length of this vector? The Euclidean distance of this vector. For, uh, from the origin, let's say, uh, uh, what you're saying is the distance between two vectors. I want to know the length of this vector. You can't simply add them, right? What is the Euclidean distance? Yes. Sorry. Well, root of, you take the individual elements, square them. And add them together. Whatever is the resultant that you get, that's essentially a measure of the length of this. Okay, and this, in fact, agrees with uh, our intuition. I mean, uh, in uh, with uh, with reality as well. For example, if you define what is one uh, for you in 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 space, and if you look at this point, let's say this is the origin. Uh, let's say this is one. That means this point is somewhere there. One. 2 and 3. This point is somewhere here. And if you measure this uh, distance between the origin and this point, that will exactly be this number. Okay. Well, if you can do that for three dimensions, then you can extend it to n dimensions. So, a uh, very popular way of measuring length of vectors in, uh, in linear algebra is this. If I have a vector x that belongs to Rn, then the Euclidean norm, which is represented, this is called the Euclidean norm. We won't say magnitude of a vector, we'll always say norm of a vector. The Euclidean norm is represented like this. 
uh, two strange uh, vertical bars and then the subscript of two. This is simply the square root of x1 square, x2 square, xn square. Okay. Simple extension of distances, how we measure distances in R2 and R3. Okay. <laughs> And again, like with the inner product, this is not the only possible way to measure distances. Okay? There are other possible ways. Okay? In fact, there are infinitely many ways of measuring distances in, in, in higher dimensions. Once you leave R1, once you leave the real line, then all these possibilities come up. In, with the real line, there is only one, which is essentially the absolute. You can define other ones as well, but the most natural one seems to be just this uh, absolute value of the real number. Right? So you, the norm, Right? is usually represented by two vertical lines and the vector goes in the middle. I'll put a dot here to say any vector goes in the middle. Is usually a norm is represented like this. And this essentially is a function that takes a vector x and then simply spits out a non-negative real number okay? because the length cannot be negative. Uh, so essentially, a set of real numbers that cannot be negative. Okay? So, norm is essentially a function. If you give it a vector, it will give you some uh, non-negative non real number, okay? which is supposed to measure essentially the length of this vector. Okay? Any function that satisfies, I mean, that is like this, and satisfies a set of properties would, would be a valid norm for you to use in your application. And there are many different ways of defining norms. Uh, I'll, we'll look at some of the properties. For example, if this function is to be a norm of a vector space, then if you give it the zero element, it must always report zero. Length of the zero element for a valid norm should be zero. Okay. If I give it any vector, any arbitrary vector, it should, the length should always be greater than or equal to zero. That's again based on this definition. If I take my vector, and I scale it by some number alpha, and I take its norm, the uh, norm should essentially scale by the same amount. That means this will be equal to the absolute value of the scaling factor multiplied by the norm of the original vector. Okay, And then the last one is called the triangle inequality. Okay. If you have two vectors x plus y, The length of the resulting vector has to be less than or equal to the length of the individual vectors. Okay. If you have a function that satisfies all these four properties, then you can use it for measuring length in your in your space. Okay, for your application. Okay, I will simply uh, finish today's session by listing some other interesting norms. Um, uh, and then we'll we'll conclude for today. Okay. Again, see, we wrote two here. Okay. That that should already tell you maybe there are other numbers that can go here as well. And it turns out you uh, there are. This is another name for the Euclidean norm. Is the two norm. Okay. So in general, you have. The concept of a p norm, okay, where p is, uh, in fact, less than or equal to infinity, and p is an integer, a uh, non uh, well, positive integer. Okay. And the definition is very simple. You saw two here, see another way to write this. Hmm. Take this, and then you do half. You see two here, there are, there are twos that appear here, and then there is a two here. You do the same thing. You take your xi, you take the absolute value, you raise it to the power p, and then you add all of them together, and then you take the p through. Okay, you ask why do we have this weird definition? Because it turns out. Uh, this satisfies all those properties. You can verify that. And these again, some of these p norms 
have turned out to be very useful. Okay. Now, since p can be any number from uh, 1 to infinity, uh, p can be 1. So, we can ask what is the 1 norm of a vector? 1 norm is very simple. p is 1, that means it's just 1. 1 by 1 is 1. So, it's simply the sum of the absolute values of the elements of your of your vector. So, if I give you a vector 4 and 3, 4 and minus 3, okay, what would be the one norm of this according to this definition? Well, you take the individual elements, take their absolute value and simply add them all together. There will be absolute value of 4 plus absolute value of minus 3, which will be 7. Okay, what about the two norm? What is the two norm of this? Five, yeah. Well, I can ask what is the three norm? You don't have to do it. You simply take this cube, absolute value of this cube, add them together, take the cube. But here is another strange thing. I put less than or equal to infinity. It turns out you can also define an infinity norm. Well, it's not clear what that would be because if you take this and raise it to the power infinity, you get infinity. And then you're saying take that infinity and take the infinite root of that. Okay. It turns out the infinity norm just have a very natural definition, and that definition is simply this. It's the maximum. So you take you look at all the elements and you find out whichever one has the maximum absolute value that you report as the length of the vector. So this is maximum over all possible i absolute value of xi. Okay. So what will be the infinity norm of this vector? This will simply be 4. Okay. If this is 1, what will be the infinity norm of this? No, no, absolute value 3. It will be 3. In this case, it will be 3. That's all. Okay. So essentially, which is the largest, uh, which is the element with the largest value in this uh, in this vector and that, that you report that as the length of the vector. Okay. All right. So, uh, there is again geometry associated with this. Maybe I will quickly go through it. You can then think about uh, why they have this shape. Okay. Now, let us say we are talking about R2, right? And I ask you, where are all the set of all points in R2 whose Euclidean norm is 1? Do you understand the question? I want you to tell me what all points in R2 have the Euclidean norm to be 1. Okay, it means is 1. If I square this, I will still get 1. The square of this is nothing but x1 square plus x2 square equals 1. What is this the equation of, if you remember? Circle? What is the equation of a circle in, in a plane? x square plus y square equals 1 or uh, uh, equals c, this is it. So, the set of all points whose Euclidean norm is 1 in R2 is essentially a unit circle. So, if you take any points from this circle and you compute its norm, it will be of length 1. Okay. What about the 1 norm? Well, it is essentially a set of all points from, uh, uh, from R2 such that x1, maybe the absolute value throws you off. Uh, the simplest way to make sense of this is you initially only consider positive values for x1 and x2 and then consider positive values of x1, negative values of x2 and all combination and then find out what it will look like. It'll, so, if you do that, what you will find is there. Yeah. That is what the one norm, set of all points with uh, whose, un, uh, whose one norm is 1 look like. So, if you take any point from here and compute the one norm, its one norm will be 1. Okay. The infinity norm on the other hand, again you can verify this later on, is essentially this. If you take any points on this square and you compute its uh, infinity norm, 
the report i mean the resultant value will be 1 so this is the one norm this is the two norm this is the infinity norm where do you think the arbitrary p norm lies p greater than 2 take a guess hey well it was for one it was like this two it became like this and then infinity it became a square turns out an arbitrary p norm will have a shape like this in between the square and the so as you keep increasing p this the circle essentially uh, distorts and eventually becomes a square this is in two dimensions if you talk about three dimensions uh, in three dimensions the set of all points that have two norm as one is essentially this a sphere uh, and the infinity norm would be a box would be a cube of length 2 so on and so forth okay so we'll stop here if there are any questions we'll discuss them and then otherwise we'll we'll discuss i mean i know there is there is a lot uh, to unpack here uh, but this, all this is absolutely vital uh, to go forward okay, so please make sure you go and uh, revise this because once we go to matrices i will assume you know what is linear independence i'll assume you know what is subspaces uh, and just move on okay all right if there are no questions we stop here thank you okay.